Okay, if you're all ready, then let's start. Welcome to all of you speakers and participants, both on Zoom and in the live stream on YouTube. Welcome to these webinars on reductionism in risk assessment, to put it briefly. My name is Diederik Sprangers. I am the scientific coordinator of ENSER, European Network of Scientists for Social and Environmental Responsibility. What are we going to talk about in these webinars? Um, what are we talking about, I should say, because it's the second of three already. We're talking about um, EU legislation and how it's being carried out, particularly how it's being carried out. The EU has got reasonably, reasonably good legislation for chemicals, for pesticides, for genetically modified organisms. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. Um, but it could, in principle, offer the high level of protection that the EU promises for our health and our environment. Yet, the practice is very permissive. We have we find a lot of toxic substances in our environment and in our bodies. Um, we find genetically modified organisms in our feed. And there's a lot of criticism from activists, from citizens and from scientists alike about the state of our environment and the state of our health. How come this discrepancy, this strange discrepancy between principles and practice how does this come about? The answer to that question is in the way in which science is used to make policy. There's a special kind of reductionism at play in this. Four scientists, four members of ENSA wrote a paper about this published in the scientific journal Environmental Sciences Europe a few months ago. This paper focused on genetically modified organisms and that paper formed the basis of this series of three webinars. But the webinars expand the view slightly to pesticides and to other chemicals as well. Um, this is the second of three webinars, as I said, and the three out of the four authors of the paper are among the speakers, plus a fourth pesticides specialist. Um, they are, in the first place, the speaker of today, Dr. Angelika Hilbeck of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. Then Professor Brian Wynne of Lancaster University in the United Kingdom. Professor Eric Millstone of the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom. And finally, Dr. Angeliki Desimachu of the Pesticides Action Network Europe in Brussels. All of them are present today and will be happy to join the discussion, but um, Dr. Hilbeck is the principal speaker today. What are the consecutive webinars about? The first one last week, last Thursday, took a look at how the EU has interpreted the role of science in policymaking and how this interpretation has developed over time. It did this for policy in general and for pesticides in particular. Today's webinar focuses on genetically modified organisms. And next week, well, if you criticize something, you must also offer a better solution. And that's what the last webinar next week does with Professor Brian Wynne. It suggests a better way to use science in policymaking, hopefully resulting in a safer environment and a better public health. This is why we entitled the whole series, Getting EU Risk Assessment to Achieve Its Legal Objectives and Escaping Reductionist Fallacies. We intend to get into a discussion with you, the audience, the participants, so you're invited to ask questions and, or put in comments, either in speaking or in writing. Um, if you want to say something, raise your hand. You can do so, do so digitally by going to the list of participants and um, 
click on the icon beside your name and your hand will be raised. Um, and we'll give you time to speak. If you want to ask a question in writing, put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. There's also a Q&A icon. If you press that, you can write a question and we'll read it out and discuss it. In both cases, just like in a physical conference or a physical workshop, we want you to state your name and affiliation. We're not dealing with anonymous questions. However, um, we have to look at the privacy because these webinars are recorded and they will be published, published online. The recordings will be put online afterwards on our YouTube channel. Um, if you've uh, looked carefully at the registration form when you registered, you have, sent, you have seen the line that by registering, you give you permission for publishing and live streaming your spoken remarks and your video image online, if you speak. Um, if you write a question, we shall not mention your name and affiliation because we would have to check with all of you individually um, to get admittance for public, to get your permission for publication. But we do want to see your name and affiliation with a written question. Um, you may notice that we shall not see you when you speak to ask a question or to put in a comment. Um, your webcam will remain switched off. Uh, we could make you visible as well, which would be nice, but this requires a little technical trick and the whole performance, technical performance of these webinars is still relatively new to us. So we've decided not to do this for the moment. I think that's all I had to say. So I'd like to hand over to Dr. Hilbeck now. Um, her webinar is entitled GMO Regulations and Their Interpretation. How current risk assessments of GMOs are bound to fail. And I believe she wanted to be introduced by Professor Millstone first to make the bridge from his webinar last week to today. Over to you. The screen is yours. Thank you. And I think I will share the screen. Or Eric, you will start with your presentation first with a few slides to connect us to last week's webinar from where I will pick then on uh, take it further and uh, provide the example of GMOs. So it's up to you, Eric. And Thank please you very much. Else mute your microphones, yes, if you haven't done so yet. Thank you very much, Angelica, for giving me the opportunity to contribute today. And I'm just going to show a few brief slides indicating some of the legislative benchmarks that the European Union had set for its regulatory system of ag agricultural GMOs. These are the goals that should be met. And then I, I'll pass it back to Angelica, who will explain uh, how and why it turns out that these uh, legislative goals are not being complied with, they're not being met, and, and, and show how that, uh, that's come about and, and thereby indicating some of the things that would need to change before these legislative um, aims and objectives are attained. So let me just start with um, the directive set up in 2001 in relation to the environmental release of um, genetically modified organisms and the text says that regulatory and environmental regulations of GMOs should be based on the principle that preventative action should be taken. And the precautionary principle has to be, you know, should be taken account. It says must be taking it taken into account. Uh, it's it's not, an op, not an option, it's an obligation on regulatory institutions such as the European Food and Safety Authority to do so. And then in relation to an environmental risk assessment, it says that 
a, a company, an organization or a person wanting to release a GMO must provide the EU with the technical dossier with a full environmental risk assessment, and not a partial one. A partial one does not comply with the legislation. Um, it has to be comprehensive and exhaustive. Um, and it says, you know, member states should, in accordance with the precautionary principle, ensure that all appropriate measures are taken to avoid adverse effects, not just some appropriate measures or a few appropriate measures. It says all. So the benchmark is a high one. And the regulation in really of, of 2003 in relation to food and feed says that agricultural GMAs must not have adverse effects on human health, animal or the environment. Uh, and that they can't be authorized for use unless they adequately and sufficiently demonstrate that it, that it complies with the requirements. They, they must have no adverse effects. And, and just a few slight ones is too much. No, they mustn't have any. And again, another article in the same legislative uh, do documents says, yes, all appropriate must, pressures must be taken to prevent adverse effects, not diminish them, prevent them. Yes, not just some measures to prevent, but all measures to prevent. Um, and then the community claims that it, after its scientific evaluation, of the highest possible standard um, must prevent any risks. So again, we've got high legislative benchmarks. And I pass it back now to Angelica to explain how and why these benchmarks are not being complied with. Okay, to unmute myself. So I try to share the screen again. Thank you very much, Eric. Do you all hear me fine? Yes, good. It's good to know, reassuring to see. Um, thank you, Eric. So uh, you've, you've set out not only the benchmark, but also I'd like to name it or phrase it, a bit of the spirit that is captured in these legislative texts. So there is, there is a high ambition there. We want to really make sure the environment is protected, really make sure the human beings' health and animal well-being is protected. So not just a little bit and just barely, but you know, the spirit is we want to aim, we want to do a first-class job here, not just a mediocre job. So let's see um, if that if that high ambition is being met. So just to illustrate to you again or let you know, most of what we're talking about here, at least what I present now in my uh, presentation this afternoon, you will find elaborated and backed up with uh, many, many um, references and the relevant background information in this review article we published this year in Environmental Science Europe. So please consult and go back to that if you have any questions, in addition to, of course, this webinar. We want to tease out now parts of it. We cannot go into uh, the equal depth into every aspect. We cover a lot of ground in these regulations in this paper. But I'm teasing out some aspects of it in order to illustrate the point we are trying to get across. And the point we're trying to get across, the key issue here, is the reductionism that is woven into the interpretation of a highly ambitious and fairly holistic legislative text, as we have just been presented by Eric Milstone. So, the, and believe you me, those, these, this legislative text has been or was fought hard for. It didn't come easy to the EU, regardless which institution you're talking to. This was uh, the outcome of decades of debate and processes, of democratic processes. 
and it was fought tooth and nail for many of these uh, terminologies, whether it was any risk or all should be uh, considered. All of these phrases and words in legal text are hard fought for. They don't just happen coincidentally or by, by chance. So the next, once this legislative framework was, was agreed upon and went into effect, the next challenge then happened, or the fight continued basically, because it was now carried to the lower level, if you wish, to the implementation level and the interpretation level. And it was tasked to other authorities. And of course, it's, it went much more behind the scene now, because it wasn't anymore this, this widely shared and open process as it is when you deliberate on new legislation and try to get new, new laws. Now it becomes more, um, an action of, of institutions and authorities who work in panels, in closed rooms, and it becomes much more difficult for the public to follow the processes, what's going on there, and is the spirit and the ambition of the legislation actually been met by it or not. And it is our argument now that I want to illustrate with this presentation that these high ambitions that the legislation sets out is not being met by the interpretation of those laws by the relevant panels who were tasked now to put this and put this into life and make this alive. And the way they approached it uh, is that they, with a maximum narrow or reductionistic interpretation of a fairly broad and holistic, if you wish, um, legislative goals. And it begins, this, this uh, uh, reductionism begins right at the very first step from the start of environmental risk assessment. And this is uh, uh, taken as the scheme that EFSA had given, has given her itself, um, the experts of the GMO panel, to interpret in its guidance for environment risk assessment uh, to interpret the law, that it's their interpretation of the law that they had to now make workable. And the issue we're taking starts at step one, basically, right here, the comparative safety assessment. It is already peculiar, at least in my mind, that before you engage in a risk assessment that comes actually here, and the objective ERA stands for environmental risk assessment, you had as a upstream, the first upstream step, you would start with a safety assessment. So in my mind, this was already a bit of a, a, an awkward construction. How can you assess safety before you assess the risk? All right. So we had a closer look at what this is and uh, um, what is behind it. And in essence, what stands behind this is nothing more than basically the reintroduction of an old concept that we had already debated 10, 20 years ago, if not longer. And that is the, the substantial equivalence um, um, concept. And what it did, what this step does, it, it serves as a key step to reduce already what types of hazards are even going to be considered in the downstream ERA, environmental risk assessment. So it is a fundamentally a reduction step. So that's what this filter should be indicating. It filters out already what goes off, what I usually name the radar screen of risks and hazards you are going to consider and which ones are going off that screen. Meaning what goes off here, the risk scenarios, the hypotheses, the hazard scenarios, etc., that go off at this step will never come in again, you will miss inevitably in the later steps you are assessing it. So it's a key step. It's a fundamental step. This decides what are you going to look at and what are you not going to look at. And that's the important question. So what it was in the end really is just a renaming of a concept of substantial equivalence that had been debated in the 90s, if not earlier, my colleagues would know that, in the realm of the risk assessment for food with GMOs, GM food. And it has been, my colleague Eric Millstone has written a widely cited and, and read uh, article on this. It has been disputed and debated decades ago, mainly because it is a completely undefined concept. There is no proper threshold or benchmark from what 
what needs to be met in order that a substance derived from GM products or GM crops could not be substantially equivalent. And if you don't have such a cutoff point and threshold, you can interpret basically everything in there. So from when on is a food, it was discussed in the food risk RNA, not equivalent anymore to its conventional counterpart. So it was also tried to introduce this, this concept uh, in the environment risk assessment debate. And it came there along or was phrased as a concept of familiarity. It was debated and it was found that it is not suitable for discussing and assessing risk of an organism that is going to be released into the environment where we have no control over it anymore. So the concept of familiarity, concept of substantial equivalence was discussed in the Cartagena Protocol, also discussed in the directive discussion, and it was rejected for both at the international level and at the EU level. Nevertheless, EFSA brought it back in as the first defining step for the guidance on environment risk assessment. So the comparative assessment is basically what it is, is, is another name for substantial equivalence and it does what substantial equivalence concept was also doing. It reduces the organism to, a, to parts and leads the focus and the attention in the subsequently following risk assessment to an added chemical coded for, again, these are all um, metaphors, if you wish, by that stretch of DNA called transgene that is being engineered in the uh, genetically modified crop. In our case, this is the Bt toxins. For other GMOs, it would be other proteins. And it arrives at, the, that at its conclusions that regarding risk, the data should be based on the protein, these transgene products, the protein the transgene codes for in its isolated form that is usually derived from artificial bacterial surrogate systems, not the GM plant. So not only do you have here the first filter step and reduction step of, of taking into account what the attention should focus on, the attention should focus on, on the added protein, transgene protein only, but following that, there is a second reduction step that we are elaborating on also in our paper, which is called the problem formulation step, where you find the reduction already on what kinds of types of hazards of, that might arrive from these proteins, from these added proteins, should be looked at. And then it can become as broad as you wish, because you've set the frame and the scope right from the get-go already as narrow as possible. So within that narrow frame, you then can look at all kinds of things, or it makes it look as if you were looking at a lot of specific areas of risk, but only within this narrow framework. This is basically the ERA proper, as I call it, the, the environment risk assessment as you do hazard identification, exposure and ha risk characterization, and you look at risk management strategies in total. And you can cover for that all of these specific areas of risk, but you don't have to do that. So I'll explain now uh, along a couple of case examples. Um, firstly, about uh, along GMBT plants how this reduction, reducing it to the chemical works and what it entails for risk assessment. But first, I would like to elude your attention to or note that in the end, when a final decision is being made, whether or not you are going to release it and give an approval or not, you are counterbalancing your findings from a risk assessment to what is claimed to be Benefits, of course, you want to see, we're taking risk, okay, we better get more benefits and risk from it, and then you make, an, uh, make a, a final um, decision whether you approve something or not. Now, note that the benefits are usually assessed all-inclusive, as I now name it, and this frame here is actually fairly important, as you see it. The all-inclusive benefits only address or are addressed the entire package of the entire technology, which includes the plant, the transgene, the products it does, and later on we will see also the chemicals. So 
any benefit, the benefit radar screen, if you wish, is almost unlimited. You can put on it the reduction of pesticide use that might be a consequence of growing these GM crops, the higher yield that might be a consequence of growing these GM crops that might give the farmer more profit and that the farmer with this additional profit might send his kids, kids to school or might be able to buy health coverage, etc., etc. This is all going into the all-inclusive benefits assessment. Holistic, if you wish, holistic. Now this changes now fundamentally when you go to risk assessment that all of a sudden now becomes all exclusive exercise. And this exclusivity manifests itself or is implemented through reducing and taking that package apart. That's why that, that frame around here has disappeared. It opens the package up and it divides it in different pieces, in parts. It divides it in the original plant part, in the transgene construct, and in the code, in the products that the transgene construct is supposedly coding for, meaning the target protein you want to have and all the other transgenic proteins that are coded for by other stretches uh, of the DNA or what's in the construct, like the, the promoters and terminators, the marker genes, etc., what have you. Then it goes on and splits those up again into the target effect, the target gene. In our case, this is the BT transgenic proteins and the other B transgenic proteins. This is now where the substantial equivalents come in. You then check that plant, that original plant that was received the transgene, whether or not it changes in some basic chemical composition like amino acids, ash content, protein content, etc., what makes up a plant basically. And you declare it if there is, without having a benchmark from when on something is not substantially equivalent, and you declare it as safe through substantial equivalence. So you don't need to look at the plant anymore. And you move on and say, okay, if the plant is safe, I only look at the protein. The protein is just an add-on like a pesticide to the plant. Therefore, in this case, the target effect is a pesticidal effect. Therefore, it doesn't matter. I treat it as a pesticide and subject it to pesticide testing guidelines, just so that you follow that narrative. The fundamental idea behind this also at the fundamental biological level is, that a certain sequence of nucleotides coding for a particular protein will always in every genomic context de deliver you the exact same transgenic protein, no matter whether, whether it's expressed in a microbe or expressed in cotton or expressed in corn or expressed in poplars or expressed anywhere. The protein that is expressed by this transgene construct will be the same and therefore for safety testing you can just as well use the one from microbes because you can generate and get them from a microbe in the large quantities you need for running some tests much easier than from the plant. So and that means also a transgenic protein test done with microbial formulations can be can apply for any of these applications, can apply for BT cotton, can apply for corn, can apply to anybody. You just need to make the argument and convince the panels or the regulatory authority that they are equivalent enough so that they count as a safety test for that specific purpose. The other proteins are hardly ever tested. And if so, they are tested just by the same mindset. They go and do the microbial extraction, purification, and then run some basic tests following the idea of chemical substance testing, pesticide substance testing. Needless to say, the transgene construct is patented. No, no, um, we're not gonna do any safety tests on DNA, um, on DNA, period. So for us, this uh, clearly shows that we have a, quite an imbalance here. We see that the benefits are, are, if they are tested or evaluated, they're not tested, they're promoted, they're, they're postulated, they don't even need to document proof, it's anticipated, that could be all-inclusive for the full package, the GM 
plant, the O, the GM organism, as the O stands for organism. Vice versa, the all-exclusive risk that is narrowed down to the maximum reduced one that you can possibly legitimately claim that you've looked for safety for, and that's the sheer protein that should come out of the expression of the transgene construct. So quite an imbalance we find. Now, this is met, that GMO is meeting in reality. This is the kind of environment it will encounter and it will meet the receiving environment. And by law, in those legislation, you're required to consider, and that sets the uh, GMO directive a little bit apart from other regulations, the term receiving environment is an important term in that legislation. You shall be doing these assessments in consideration of the receiving environment. The legislator has understood that an organism in a receiving environment in a temperate region, like say Norway, might act differently than when you release that organism in a receiving environment at the tropical zone. So taking that into account, you must consider in your risk assessment the receiving environment. Now the receiving environment is full with life above ground and below ground, and it will encounter them in all kinds of forms and during all parts of their life cycle, which can be very, very different. And it is the entire organism with everything, interacting compounds, defense compounds that interact possibly with a BT compound, multiple BT compounds, etc., pesticides, and all the other substances that are still applied in an agronomic context. So it's quite messy out there, and it is very difficult to uh, come to reasonable risk scenarios, risk conclusions, and define the protocols, how you should test these, these very complex interactions out there. The Bt protein will find its way through other animals that have digested it. In agriculture environments, a big component is because it's used as feed primarily. So any animal that is being fed with these transgenic um, commodity crops will produce manure. It is detectable in the manure. First it was denied that it's there, then it was found it is there, and then it was denied that it can do anything. So through manure, these various compounds will find their way into the soil. In the soil, you will find other organisms, microbial and macrofauna, that feed and, on them or are exposed to them in one way or another. It can leach, it can through leaching processes be transported to different spaces in the, in the ecosystem. It can reach aquatic ecosystems and be completely transported to some other place where the original the origin, the emitter of the, um, of the BT and of the GM product is not, even, is not even visible anymore, possibly. However, given this complexity and given these, this, uh, um, the difficulty also of, of um, coming up with good and, and meaningful risk scenarios and hypotheses, EFSA has decided that they want to reduce and keep the hazard identification process to the maximum minimum. And in order to do so, they're building uh, on a number of undocumented or outdated concepts for the risk assessment. These apply to mode of action that is, uh, leads to specificity, which leads to the efficacy determination and leads to um, what kinds of non-target effects are being seen or expected, basically. So EFSA, uh, the, the paradigm EFSA panel usually has or is, is putting emphasis on is that uh, they accept the narrative that GM plant versus microproduced toxins are identical. They accept the um, outdated um, narrative that there is only one mode of action of these Bt proteins that lead to a high specificity of that these proteins only affect a few insect taxa. Interestingly, only those that human beings have declared to be pests. And therefore, they cannot and will not affect other organisms that human beings have declared not to be pests and are called non-target organisms or non-target effects. If you go now and screen the literature and you look what has been published in the scientific literature, you find 
that there is no documentation that the GM and microbe and plant produced transgenic compounds are identical. In fact, there is evidence that they are different. There is multiple modes of actions have been reported for Bt toxins. The specificity is broader than has been anticipated. Many taxa can be infected and consequently there is reports out there that many so-called non-target organisms that are not being considered pests and some of them are considered beneficial can also be affected and have shown adverse effects. This is one paper I will not uh, dwell on it, but this is one paper where I was a part of, where we went in excruciating detail to look basically nucleotide by nucleotide, amino acid by amino acid, what the protein, what protein types are produced by plants and by the microbes that contain the same transgene construct. To cut that long paper short, uh, we did not find a single incidence where a microbe produced an identical protein as the plant was producing. Instead, we found many differences, truncations, mutations, but we also found a lot of additions from creating, artificially creating even novel types of toxins with fairly unknown that have never been produced in nature, that were created in the lab, and the explicit goals by the developers of these novel toxins were to increase the toxicity to target pests, to have more new target pests, so to broaden their, um, the range of organisms they can um, affect and, and control with it. And of course, to have new patents because the old ones are running out. So this is a quote from another report that uh, I was part of, uh, published last year. We're looking into this narrative as well, where the conclusion was common industry and regulator narrative maintains that none of these alterations matter much when it comes to environmental, human and animal health safety issues, while they do matter and induce significant novelties and changes with regard to patents and efficacy. We find that this is a double standard that cannot be uh, reconciled um, unless you, you give up one narrative on one side. Regarding the mode of action, this is usually the mode of action that you see here. There's one, the classical model that's been um, put forward since decades on how BT works, basically with little deviation, uh, different types. If you screen the literature, you'll find at least two others that are not necessarily similar or complementary to those. You can find these explained and critically explained and evaluated in this publication that I'm listing here. And you could, you, we also know since at least 10, 10 years and more, that all of these impacts, the mode of action of these toxins, BT toxins, can be significantly modulated by antibacterial substances, antibiotics. And they can, to the extreme, they can quench an effect completely so that you see a high effect when you offer the BT protein to a insect that is highly susceptible, and if you add antibiotics to it, it will not show any effect. There has been a lot of dispute about this work by a group of scientists. Dispute, but the dispute was not about whether or not antibacterial interfere with the manifestation of the effects. The dispute was about where in the chain of events here in that entire succession of, of steps of, of toxicity, where it would interfere, but that it interferes is pretty established. This will matter later on when I explain some of the protocols. So for the exposure of non-target organisms in food, food webs, their exposure is clearly underestimated if you keep it very narrow only to the Bt protein and you don't consider that this is, comes embedded in plant material, will move to other compartments of the environment and persist much longer in the food web than commonly declared or expected. It occurs in different bio biochemical forms than it does in microbes and their presence can extend way beyond the presence of the Bt toxin, meaning the plant. Through pollen and plant residues, through leaching processes, it can reach other both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. And they can spread further through as of now unrecognized processes like for example intergenerational transfer 
uh, a team of scientists have a, kind of a couple of years ago published a number of papers where they showed that the Bt transgene, the Bt, not the transgene, the protein, can even be transferred from one generation to the offspring in some organisms. These are a number of organisms we found or are reported, published in the literature that have shown adverse effects when exposed to either Bt plant material or to prey that has fed on plant material, etc. For some of those, uh, the more publicized examples are the lacewings and some coccinellid species here. They are circled in red. These were works that my team has been doing since 25 years. This is another um, field of, for Daphnia, where a good colleague of ours has been deeply involved in and, and argued with EFSA about it. So the, there's a growing diversity of adverse affected species reported in the scientific literature, most of which cannot be detected in short-term acute toxicity tests that follow the first tier OECD toxicity protocols that are being proposed to test for as, or serve as safety documentation in these um, dossiers that are submitted to the regulator for approval. And we find that there is continued bias and double standards applied in EFSA assessment. So all studies reporting unexpected adverse effects on non-target organisms have been and are dismissed. While most, almost all studies confirming no adverse effect are accepted with rare and recent exceptions. And most of them are accepted without big, a lot of scrutiny in them. Arguments for dismissal are the studies, the organisms that have been reported to be adversely affected, like these up here, they are out of range. They are not on the range that we know or the, the, the narrow paradigm postulates can only be affected by the BT. They are out of that postulated range, therefore they cannot be affected. That's one, and it's not meeting the expectations. And it, you see a lot of double standards applied where you can bridge data to show safety, but you cannot bridge data to show risks. And this is what I'm going to go into with a couple of examples now so that you see the, the, the writing and the argument from, from the EFSA panel. So this is, for example, from a assessment of MON810, that's the only um, approved uh, GM product plant for, in Europe for agriculture for cultivation. The GMO panel in the renewal of that of that license so that they can be continue to be grown. The GMO panel argued on the findings by the Paula and Ando team a number of years ago that there could be intergenerational transfer of the protein from parents to offspring. They argued that their work has no direct relevance for the environmental risk assessment of MON810 because none of the proteins the team has tested, of the cry proteins, the Bt proteins they have tested, correspond exactly to the protein that's expressed in MONI10, namely CRY18B. Okay, so you cannot draw any risk conclusion from studies using, as Paul and Ando have done, CRY1AC, a closely related uh, Bt protein to CRY1AB, or any other cry toxin. You've got to work with CRY1AB, otherwise you cannot draw any risk conclusion. Now let's see. That surely applies or should surely apply also to safety conclusions, shouldn't it? Now that is another conclusion by the panel where they reject another report of various CRY proteins on Harmonia axirides, which is a non-target ladybird species where they say based on the known spectrum of activity of CRY1AC and CRY1F proteins and its selectivity, so feeding directly into that narrow paradigm I've been laying out earlier, two Lepidopteran species and the phylogenetic distance between ladybirds being coleopteran species and the target species being lepidopteran species, the susceptibility of the coleopteran species to CRY1AC and CRY1F is not expected at field concentrations. Now you surely would think that a expectation is not good enough that you actually want to see some proof of that. 
they continue to say similar findings of no adverse effects as they've induced uh, expected or, or have stated as expected above have been reported in the scientific literature for cry one f and other bt proteins on this lady beetle in direct feeding assays ingestions of biologically active purified cry one ac cry 2ab cry one ca cry one f and a distant almost a very different type of protein vip 3 a did not negatively affect their development survival or weight one study now that is peculiar because nobody tested cry one ab which is the toxin expressed in 1A10, and that's within the realm of this assessment, this, these statements were made. So you can draw from as far away as VIP3A proteins on the expected safety of a non-target organism if it supports your expectation that you don't think there will be an effect then is bridging okay, but showing that there is a risk, you have to work with the exact protein. That's a double standard. The GMO panel argued, wait a minute, this one. So interestingly, in that same citation, in that same statement, I noticed that as support for their claim, they cited one study, Ali et al. Now, surely I would expect that the EFSA panel is applying the same level of scrutiny to studies that postulate safety as they apply to studies that postulate or say there could be a risk or a safety issue. Well, if you read the Ali et al. study and publication, which I did, you do see that they must have not looked very carefully to this study because you find quite easily in the materials and methods that this group of scientists has added an unexplained excessive amount of antibiotics to their testing protocol, of which we know antibiotics, I alluded to for earlier, can mask impact of Bt toxins. That surely would have been worth a question, wouldn't it? That question has not been asked. Ali et al was used as, a, as the backup of the statement. Now let's move on to the next example. What about herbicide tolerant plants? Now, you should probably are getting now slowly into the mode how these kinds of assessments are working. Now, for this application, it is definitely the entire package that does the benefit. The benefit for this particular technology package comes exclusively from the application of the Roundup, the pesticide. Without the pesticide, IO is completely useless and has zero benefit. So it's that very package. So you would think that for a risk assessment, you would also look what that package does in the environment. Now, I guess you, you're guessing by now what is happening is, of course, the exact opposite. That package for benefits is taken apart for risk assessment. And here we find, in addition to the transgene protein, which is a substitute enzyme similar enough to the native enzyme in the plants to not be blocked by glyphosate. The native enzyme is blocked by glyphosate, so the plant dies. This substitute enzyme is not blocked by Roundup, and so the plant can survive and continue to grow. But here we have an additional product that is being excluded from the application, and that is Roundup. That's the pesticide, a broad spectrum herbicide we have been speaking about in our last webinar. And that product, as we've also addressed in the last webinar, is taken apart additionally and separated into the formulation ingredients and into the postulated active ingredient. And now we're looking at the whole picture for this particular technology package. We have three different regulations that come into play that have not been designed to talk to each other. That's the regulation and EU regulation that looks at active ingredients only. We had that discussion or heard about glyphosate effects versus Roundup effects. We have a separate regulation at the national member state level, 
for the ingredients that are postulated that are much less stringent than those for active ingredients, although we know that products like talawamine can be almost just as bad for the plant or as herbicidal as the active ingredient. And then we have another e regulation again at the EU level for GMOs. Now the GMO regulation only looks at this. So that means because of that enzyme being so, so uh, close to the native enzyme, there is basically no testing being done for environment risk and safety assessment. This is what is behind when you hear product-based risk assessment, that's what you get. So the conclusion and core problems that we're seeing with applying these narrow um, ERA models is that it effectively denies biological complexity and contingency. It ignores interactions between the toxins, other compounds in a plant, the GM plant, and ignores the various inter-ecological communities and interactions it has with this community, above ground, below ground, and perhaps even entirely elsewhere than where the GM crop is grown. The consequences are, EFSA is thus thereby, by accepting these dossiers, relieving, relieving the applicants from their obligation to pr prove actually the safety of their products based on up-to-date data and the most recent science, and is placing the burden of proof on people like us, independent scientists with extremely limited funding who are going against that stream and are struggling uphill against the powerful um, corporate interests that are behind these narrow interpretations. So in our view, we postulate or consider this a reversal of the precautionary principle. And for this, actually, it doesn't matter whether these are the old GMOs or the new GMOs that are going to be coming along. This principle will apply to all of them because it's a fundamental uh, principle of application. All we want, what we argue for, is that these all-inclusive holistic benefit assessments are met on equal eyesight with a likewise all-inclusive risk assessment. If you assess the benefits of a herbicide-tolerant plant with its herbicide in its totality as the benefit, you have to assess the risk of that package as well in all its beauty and detail. And it is not that we would be lacking models. We do have ERA models that have proposed that could do that. And they could do it fairly good. They could do it fairly efficient. efficient. We have worked on such a comp, uh, model already. We started almost 20 years ago and published them over the course of six to eight years. As, at least for non-target testing, for biodiversity testing, we have come up with a species selection procedure that embeds the ERA components. We improved the, as an alternate concept where the GMO is at the center rather than di dividing the GMO apart and reducing it to a pesticidal component. I'm not going to get into the project. You can read it all up. We have created a, basically a series, a book series, a cabby book series where you can read up on it. We have a handbook how you can do this. It's publicly available online. You can still download it today if you want to do a broader and more realistic risk assessment with GMOs. The difference between our model and the prescriptive ecotox model that's applied currently where the, the model is prescriptive with regard to species and protocols, the GMO era model that we have proposed, where the GMO is at the center, is prescriptive with regard to a selection procedure, meaning you can account for the different receiving environments and you may come up or will come up with a different suite of testing organisms depending on the receiving environment. So it's based, it's a whole plant GMO era model. It's based on a biodiversity functional approach. It starts broad and reduces the species through a number of transparent, uh, transparently applied ecological criteria like abundance, phenology, ecological significance, exposure, etc. The aim was to filter out those species for testing that are associated with the highest potential risk that come about and their ecological significance in that particular receiving environment. The selection process informs then as well 
how the scenario, the testing scenarios should look like, what kinds of risk hypotheses you should formulate, and that in turn this influences and informs how you should design your experiment to answer these risk questions. All of these are non-trivial important steps. Now comes the good, the good message or the good news, or it's actually old news, this developed model was developed with many hundred, over 100 scientists all over the world in different regions, etc., tested with different GMOs, etc. It did actually find its way into EFSA. The EFSA GMO panel has included it in its guidance, in that very guidance, the 2010 guidance they have published, and that's valid to this day. They just changed a little bit the graphics and they have a bit of a hard time to acknowledge who really developed it. But leaving that aside, we were pretty happy that our product has found its way into EFSA's guidance. But let's look where they put it. That's where, it, where the bad news starts. They put that selection procedure that was meant to be a whole GMO overall ERA concept, they took parts that were for that non-target section, they put it here. After they've done a comparative safety assessment and reduced already, decided already we're only going to be looking at parts, and in the pro after the reduction step of the problem formulation where they have decided of that part, which types of, of risk and hazards are we even going to be including in our assessment, once you've done that, you can play around with our holistic ERA model. While interestingly for the problem formulation step, so the other key reduction step we have here, upstream to this downstream assessment, has been a reductionistic industry model has been implemented. That was basically, that was designed by industry. Let's we uh, show you the, the data and show you where, who was involved in our paper. We go into detail of that. So while on one hand you can claim success, yes, they listened, yes, they included it, but it came or it was placed in the whole scheme at a position where it will not be able to unfold its intended effect, if you wish. So we think and we have finished our our assessment or our paper with these sentences, and this, with this I will conclude my presentation. We stated that the problems highlighted in our paper, but also here, indicate that substantial changes are required both at EFSA and the European Commission level and in their interactions. And that at minimum, at a minimum, the Commission should properly research and understand and then deliver on the commitments concerning explicitly articulated risk assessment policies, which is what Eric Milstone has tried to, to re, uh, has re, um, lectured about. And they should do that in advance of risk assessment and in accordance with the principles they've given themselves that being inclusive and accountable procedures as stipulated in the codex provisions on risk assessment policy making a long time ago. And I think with this, all right, no, one last session, one last slide. We also conclude our paper saying that if you do that, if both EFSA Commission and EFSA panels and the Commission understand and change to these reasonable scientific assessments that actually aspire or implement the spirit of the EU legislation, you would discover something else. You would discover two major all-round benefits, namely that EFSA science is able to finally support and comply with the EU democratic legislative and regulatory objectives rather than to undermine them. And that in turn might lead to EFSA's repeated failure to achieve European public and parliamentary respect beginning to reverse. And with that, I will finish. Thank you very much. And I stop my sharing. Well, unfortunately, we can't let you let, uh, make any applause heard, but I'm sure there will be some um, 
definitely for me at least. That was a great talk. Thank you very much, Angelica. You're welcome. Curious to hear now. Let's turn to the questions. Um, let me say it again. Uh, if you want to ask a spoken question, go to the participants knob button icon at the bottom of your screen in the middle. Click on that. You'll see the list of panelists and the list of attendees. Click on the list of attendees. Look for your own name. And when you move your cursor to your own name, you'll see uh, two buttons behind, beside it. And I think the button more should uh, give you the opportunity to raise your hand digitally. And if you do that, we'll give you the opportunity to ask your question vocally. But we'll start with the written questions now. I'm seeing, um, yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. You post the phrase, I'm seeing them as well here. Okay, I, good. Yeah. Right. The first question is, safety is used differently across different disciplines. How do you use it, especially in contrast to risk and threat? And maybe we should link to that the fourth question a little way below, because that's an addendum to this question, I think from the same questioner. Okay. Um, the question is how to evaluate risk when not all influences and players are known. How can you come up with a number or a level at all? Okay. Um, and please, my colleagues also chip in because many of these questions are normative in, fundamentally normative in, in their nature as well. Um, so the benefit to, to address the question on how, do, how risk benefit um, assessments align with precautionary principle, um, you want to prevent harm from happening. So you have to have credit and you cannot just invent risk scenarios or safety scenarios. So that's, that's why we went to excruciating extent and elaborated on how you could be doing this uh, in a meaningful, ecologically meaningful manner that takes into account the complexity of the real, real outdoors, if you wish. So you, there, is, there is no simple, simple uh, answer to that. You have to come up, you have to have a process. That's why we had a deliberate uh, process where we deliberated amongst uh, a whole range of scientists with what exposure scenarios, uh, what biodiversity functions were deemed to be the most important ones that should be protected under any circumstance, which kinds could maybe are not that critical or are redundant uh, in the environment, etc. So anything, for example, that uh, biodiversity function like pollination was, was ranked very, very high because we have, we're living in a pollination, you know, a pollinator crisis. Um, circular processes, you know, destrins and, and decay uh, um, organisms who, who are recycling material are also quite important because our soils are very poor. Meanwhile, after decades of industrial production, beneficial organisms who um, exert a biological control function are quite important, etc. So, and then you can, there is not a, a simple formula of statistics. What you can do is you run your, you come up with risk hypotheses, you design your um, testing procedure that answers that risk hypothesis and then you do mathematics or you do statistics on them just like you do with everything else. But what measures, what, what qualifies for an adverse effect and what qualifies for a benefit is up to us to decide. So that's why we call for broader involvement on these fundamental questions and the rest is then sometimes technical execution. But if we're not clear what goes on that radar screen of risk assessment, what risks, what harm, what hazard scenarios shall be included, well, then you set yourself already up for failure if you go too narrow. That's why I'd rather want you start broad and then based on agreed criteria, you narrow it down. You cannot test everything, that's clear. Rather than starting narrow, and then say, okay, well, we're at a very small scope, but here you can play around if with all of these, these, these um, narrow limited of organisms. So it's, it's really, which way do we address it? And currently what EFSA does, it, it starts narrow, 
and then gives you a little bit of playground. We want to start broad and then go with transparent criteria, ecologically meaningful criteria, narrow it down so you can actually do it. May I? Yes, Eric, please. I have different the things on my screen, so yes. yes. The questioner says safety is used differently across different disciplines and the observation I want to introduce is that judgments about what counts as safety, I mean it may vary between disciplines but more importantly it varies with different value schemes and different public policies and I can illustrate with this, the, I can illustrate this with the example I was discussing last week because in the USA environmental impacts of cultivating GM crops to the extent that they're assessed. They only assess those changes that might adversely affect US, the commercial interests of US farmers. All other changes are not deemed to be harm or risk, but merely adaptations. So they don't count in, in respect of a safety judgment. And in the European Union, especially given that our agricultural environment is much more closely adjacent to non-agricultural environment, the, the term, the, the judgment about what counts as safety is broader than that in the USA because environmental risk assessments are supposed to look at adverse impacts on plants and animals, flora and fauna, irrespective of what impact they might have on farm incomes and, and so the judgments about what counts as safety is not simply one that varies between disciplines but also ones that varies across different normative frameworks. Thank you Eric. If the other speakers have nothing to say about this then let's move to the next question which is that safety, sorry, um, the next one is how does a risk benefit assessment align with the precautionary principle? I the former sounds like computation who wins and thus overrules the potential existence of any risk. A, a setup formula or statistics can make risks look insignificant. But yet it may only be a mathematical trick to distract from the precautionary principle. Well, well that, that, that's exactly what, what, what's played. I mean, um, First of all, we're, we're into the risk assessment. It's the, it's the, um, it's the regulator then that balances, hopefully, um, the perceived benefits and there's rules, different countries have different rules. And it, it relates also to what I see already now, a comment that comes later on what non-scientific criteria come in in order to influence that ultimate decision, whether approval is given, whether you have ethical considerations, socioeconomic considerations, et cetera, that go into that ultimate decision, whether or not we approve a product. For we, we look at the risks and that the scientific or the natural science risk or whatever you want to call them, they, feed into that overall um, approval process. But yes, what we're seeing in our field with the risk assessment is exactly that, to narrow um, the scope down so much and make it so much a technical issue that you just run a 48 hour static renewal pollen trial with uh, uh, some, some Daphne and say after 48 hours, if nothing happens, safe check mark, go next. These are harmonized protocols by the OECD that they are applied in this field as well, because you can technically, you just go down them, do check, 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 and if all of them don't find anything, you say safe. Okay, so that there is a mathematical component and dimension to it, and I don't object a mathematical component. It's just if you, your thinking that goes into designing those experiments is flawed, you will get flawed numbers. If your thinking goes into is formed and you set up meaningful experimental designs because you're trying to answer a question that was informed by what you see in nature and you execute it according to scientific principles with replication and sample size and all that, then mathematics is there's nothing against it. But if you use it to calculate risks away, then it's bad. But 
That's why we're here and are trying to convince regulators and policymakers that they have to look at these things at the very beginning, not at the end of the whole process, whether they did the math right. They have to see what goes into the math. Eric, Brian, do you have any, anything to say about this? Because it's on the precautionary principle specifically. Um, well, I, I could respond to, I think it's, it's Saguna's question about how does the risks benefit assessment align with the precautionary yeah. principle? Um, basically, the simple answer is it doesn't. <laughs> um, the precautionary principle is, uh, it's a deliberative question and actually probably one of the most articulate people who's spoken and written on this is Renny von Schomburg from DG Research uh, in the European Commission. But Renny, I think it's fair to say, and I'll say this in public, has been somewhat marginalised when he's tried to speak and write about the precautionary principle. Renny argues, I think quite correctly, that the precautionary principle requires us to be realistic about the variability of local circumstances. GM crops are cultivated in real environments, and as Angelica quite rightly emphasised at the outset of her talk, you know, that receiving environment question in the legislation in the 2001-18 directive is a crucial part of that directive, which is usually ignored. The environment is normally an environmental risk assessment, let alone public health risk assessment, standardised into effectively a laboratory. And real environmental variability is ignored, as is also actually real agricultural variability. As the Austrian government found as a member state of the EU uh, to its political cost, and I think nearly its economic cost, when it disagreed with EFSA risk assessments on the grounds that, many other grounds, but on the, on the central grounds, that about 30 or more percent of, ag of Austrian agricultural production is organic. And therefore, the issue of contamination of organic crops by GM grown in adjacent farms and so on, a very real um, hazard, uh, and not controlled except by very, um, uh, what's the word, well, artificial, unrealistic kinds of criteria and uh, requirements. The Austrian government's argument that EFSA's risk assessments were invalid because they did not consider the effects upon organic agriculture and the industry body in Europe, Europa Bio, tried to argue that that was only an implementation issue and not a risk assessment issue, which I found an astonishingly um, elastic um, form of reasoning when it came to the question of organic farming. Um, basically EFSA has ignored them and the Commission also has ignored them and basically just overruled the Austrian objection. That is a legitimate question about the receiving environment, socioeconomic as well as ecological, and it was just simply ruled out politically from you know, an argument which was actually about the scientific risk assessment. So that's where we are. We're in a very incoherent and actually rather political environment, and more on that next week. Um, discuss that greater than I hope. Right, thank you Brian. If there are no more comments from the speakers on this question, then let's go to the next one, saying, I find your paper on EU risk assessment very interesting and insightful, but I have one question. You didn't mention EFSA's treatment of animal feeding studies, which are arguably the main plank of evidence on health effects. Given that adverse effects of GM foods have been shown in even industry's own animal feeding studies, was there any reason why you didn't include this topic in your paper? Um, yes, there was a reason. <laughs> Am I? Yes. 
Um, there was a reason because we were dealing with environmental risk assessment primarily because that's our, our field of strength and where we have been uh, involved uh, collectively over decades now. So we know what we're talking about. And we've been there when these things were negotiated. So you cannot just make claims uh, in, in our face because we know the people, we know the arguments, we've been there. But with the health, animal feeding studies are usually considered in health. And to engage in the, the I know that the health assessment uh, part is just as bad. And I've been, we all have been involved to some extent in it, but it's not our prime prime field of where we bring our original, our own research to the table. So it was really only a, the reason of to limit, to, to limit uh, the scope of our review. We were already quite busy just addressing that. And, but certainly it merits to write a similar review um, regarding health risk, so the health assessments and the uh, experiments and the science that goes in there. Just to give you a flavor, that's why this entire um, debate about Roundup and glyphosate has been exploding to that degree, because this was uh, uh, feeding directly into the health debate. We're on, and that's politically even more charged territory and mind territory than environment risk. So environment is still a little lower than human health. So it is a minefield, but it's not like the, the, the massive calibers that are there shooting at you. But in the health field, that's a different one. So if you write an article on that, and there's been a lot written about that as well, we just couldn't deal with this complexity all in one paper. And it's just regulatory, legislative-wise, it's a different, it's in a different field. That's all. I'm not, it doesn't, I know it was fully recognized that this is massively important. The same, the same reductionism applies there, but it takes different forms, different materializations. So it takes different people who speak and reveal this. Maybe an extra webinar sometime. Yeah, but with, with a different set of people speaking. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it might be worthwhile. It is a very important aspect as the questioner says, arguably the main plank of evidence on health effects, mm -hmm. health effects. Um, let's go to the next question, uh, which is, what is your opinion on non-safety criteria in the regulation of GMOs? My question is related to other criteria, for instance, ethical, economics, etc., rather than scientific risk assessment. The reality in Europe has always been the non-cultivation of GMOs, the opt-out reasoning, which was never supported by EFSA risk assessments. EFSA always states these GMOs are safe. Yeah. Thank you. Does somebody else want to go at this? I mean, uh, okay. Uh, can I offer an observation yeah. on this? Please. Um, because for the reasons we've been discussing uh, today, last week and in our publications, um, I frequently argued that non-scientific considerations do in practice enter into these deliberations and decisions, even though their presence is not acknowledged. Which reminded me of a conversation I had with a senior British official responsible for um, providing the secretariat to the expert scientific committee, um, assessing the environmental impact of releasing GMOs. And I said, to that official, um, well, you know, why, uh, why don't you uh, assess um, non-scientific considerations as well as scientific ones? He said, oh, we don't do that. We just leave it to the market. To which, of course, I responded, sorry, you've just acknowledged that you are using socioeconomic criteria and you've told us exactly what your criterion is. And the look of shock on this person's face was remarkable. He had been making a socioeconomic assumption and taking it absolutely granted and hadn't remotely appreciated that that's what, what he was doing. And so th this is clear evidence that socioeconomic considerations invariably play a role, but a role that scientists and officials are very reluctant to acknowledge and it's that failure to acknowledge and deal with them explicitly that is a source of many of the problems. 
do that yeah. as well. Um, I know that some countries do that actually. Norway yeah. uh, is looking uh, accepting. So it's up to the countries. There's no EU wide unified you know, approach to this. If a country chooses to do so, yeah. Norway is not an EU member. I know that. But it is closely, you know, it works a lot with the, with the EU regulator. And uh, they, they have ethical considerations and socioeconomic considerations that go in there. And they request that um, explicitly there must be a added benefit if you bring them uh, to the market that need to be demonstrated to some degree before it's considered uh, approval is considered. So Norway has its own additional sets of, of uh, requirements for that. So you can do it. But we in our paper, we didn't look into this. We stuck to, as I said, in response to the earlier question, we stuck to the scientific dimension of it, which was already um, uh, difficult enough. Yeah, yeah, this is what these webinars are about. But this is definitely not the only thing. No, no, it's fully recognized. Yeah, so it, it's important. Yeah, 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 right. Thank you. The next question um, I'm observing, meanwhile, that um, nobody is raising their hand in the nobody wants to see this. No, speak. exactly. I'd like to hear some voices. <laughs> yes, I would love to as well. Um, but let's take the next written question. I am. Uh, I'm going to say the name. Um, I agree to, to your points that the reductionism of the risk assessment process of GMOs. I agree to those points. I would love to know what are the obstacles to reinventing the risk assessment paradigm. Is it from the governments or the experts in the policy community or industry influence? Well, I think maybe Angeliki may be the best one to answer that because it's the same powers and the same dynamics uh, and similar stakeholders that you are uh, encountering and facing in the pesticide regulations. Uh, corporations and government, it's, it's some of all, you know, but it's pretty straightforward who that is. <laughs> Just think once. You know it. Okay. Yeah. But uh, can I respond? And I, I think given that the question comes from an individual who acknowledges that they work um, in the Chinese Academy of Sciences, I, I think it is significant that the question is asked in relation to what's happening in China. And when I have looked at the regulation of GMO, agricultural GMOs in China, I've been, I was very, very surprised because I thought, you know, China's a different political system, it's a different culture, it will be completely different from Europe. But then I was stunned at the meetings I've attended in China on these matters, uh, just how similar were the arguments and the narratives and the perspectives in China as, as in Europe. And, and so yeah, the, the question, the question uh, says, you know, is the resistance changing it? And the, you know, the affection for the current system, does it come from the government, the experts and industry? And as Angelica has indicated, it comes from all of them. And what part of what we've been arguing is that in Europe, uh, government and industry adopt what we call a very te technocratic perspective, as if policy is based on and only on facts and values don't enter into it. And I'm repeatedly struck by the extent to which Chinese government officials invoke exactly the same kind of technocratic narrative. And partly the attractiveness of that narrative to uh, people in government, uh, to expert advisors, and to industry, is it that, that, that narrative serves to convey the impression that we have the knowledge, we have the facts, and there are no values into it, and therefore there's no choices being made. And um, it, that's why it is an uphill struggle to contest the orthodox risk assessment paradigm and say these matters are profoundly political, profoundly value based and deserve to be addressed in open and accountable ways. And uh, curiously enough, lots of governments aren't that fond of openness and accountability. <laughs>
could I, could I just add a, a word to Eric's uh, very uh, clear uh, uh, expression there, Diederik? Uh, first of all, I want to say welcome and thank you to Lucy, yeah. who is a colleague from Beijing. And uh, also in the history of Natural Sciences Institute of the Chinese Academy, which is a, a, a discipline which I very much respect and learn a lot from too. It's an extremely important and missing dimension yeah. of many of the problems that we're actually addressing here today about reductionism. The reductionism is in the science. It's also, of course, in the industrial interests, mm -hmm. which are powerfully in play, as Eric has just indicated, and Angelica too. Uh, the, the problem of reductionism in EFSA science is not a problem only of EFSA. And it's not a problem even only of the policy uh, client and funder and power agent, i.e. the European Commission and DG Sante, the Director General of Health and Consumer Protection in the European Commission, which is actually funding and controlling EFSA science. It's actually a function of academic science too. And for a long time before EFSA or GMOs ever existed. And one of the reasons for that, which I'll explain this further next week, so I won't go into it now, but it's, it's been well debated in the history of science that precision, as you know, which is effectively reductionism, in effect, in practice, you know, precision requires reductionism. You have to exclude the more complex factors that you can't precisely define or observe or test under controlled conditions, which you may not have. So in that sense, reductionism is a requirement if you prioritize only precision as your criterion of good science. There are several other factors which are also important in defining good science. Isn't realism one of them? Didn't Angel Angelica give several examples in today's session about the very unrealism of the science, which is called the best science in the world for risk assessment of GM crops? Mm -hmm. Taking and selecting only the plant protein, the purified plant protein, created by a different mechanism from transgenics in a plant, to represent a full GM plant with all of the unknown further effects of the transgenic process in the plant and in its interactions with a lot more other environmental and ecological factors. That, that is an example of precision, which is artificial. It's not realistic. That's one of our criticisms. Realism is a legitimate and necessary criterion for good science. And maybe particularly when we're doing environmental risk assessment. But the point is, the selection historically of precision mm -hmm. and behind that control, predictive control, is actually a function of exclusion of what we regard as relevant factors. That's part of the critique of the EFSA risk assessment. But let's not forget that we can, and this is part of the ways in which we can get out from under that horrendously restrictive paradigm which we're seeing from our regulators and not only by the way in Europe also in all of the member states pretty well all of them uh, Norway isn't a member state as Angelica just indicated they do it differently um, but we can rethink but it's not a, it's not something which we can just introduce next week on some kind of drawing board or spreadsheet it's not like that it's a cultural problem Normal scientists in most scientific disciplines take for granted that precision and control are the relevant factors for defining good science. And realism means complexity and complexity means difficulty and often a lot more funds, a lot more time, which we don't have, none of us have. And so it goes on. There are a lot more factors which are contributing to this problem than only the politics behind EFSA. Brian, I'd love to let you speak uh, longer on this, this very fundamental point, but we have a few more questions left and we're running late. Okay. I'd like to finish the questions, if I may. 
Um, the next one goes, excellent presentation, thank you. If we call GM plants pesticide plants, are we oversimplifying? What should we learn from EU regulation pat patterns now that genetic drives organism, gene drive organisms are right at our door? Oh, that's another lecture. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, held, we held a series of webinars we about that. Of gene drive. So uh, maybe we do a little advertisement for that. Who's interested in gene drives? Yes. We had a big, big project with a big conference and a, and a webinar series uh, on, on gene drives and their potential devastating uh, risks and, and harm they can cause. So what you can learn from EU regulations, hmm, that is a difficult one to answer because as we have pointed out, the regulations sound okay, or at least the legislation sounds okay. What you may be able to learn is that you must, you know, that after that, it comes the implementation and the interpretation, and that's where um, the struggle continues. So you still have to follow up and make sure that the, the implementation and interpretation of those laws by the, who, who it is who does that meets the spirit of your legislation. We have a gross disparency there. Uh, dis, dis, is that the right word? This dis, connection there? Yeah. yeah. Between what the legislation aspires to and what the implementation at the technical level, at guidances, etc., is trying to do. It's almost trying to, you know, sort of nullify what's been said in the law. The law wants it all and they reduce it to some, a few, maybe here and there, you know, bridge data, um, extend, transpolate, uh, tra uh, ex extrapolate, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's all not within the spirit of the law and of the legislation who wanted all risks considered under precaution, this is fundamentally not precautionary. So stay in control at every step. That's that's what it is, and you need to need to fight. And yes, in the conventional agriculture, I would say, also with you know in the non-GM conventional agriculture, the plants are pesticidal because with GMOs you get more pesticides even internally expressed. Bt is a pesticide, is an insecticide but you just get as much uh, uh, sprayed on top. So in the conventional agriculture, um, the plants are pesticidal, whether you like it or not, and the residues enter also the food chain. But this opens up a whole different, um, another series of webinars, I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. I hope the, the questioner will look at our website and take a look at the Gene Drive webinars that we held about this and at the report we wrote about that. The next question, um, the last but one, is um, even if the risk assessment refuses to take into consideration ecosystem feedbacks in scientific studies, how do they justify visible effects such as superweeds or other species that develop tolerance to GM pesticide elements? Oh, that's pretty easy. That's, that's simple to answer. They place it on the farmer. The farmer just didn't do a good job. I mean, I'm being facetious, yeah. <laughs> so, but that's really what it is, uh, what you hear uh, if you go into... First of all, I mean, the, the issue of superweeds, all of us with gray hair were there when that concept was launched, right? With the very conceptual, the con con conception of even producing herbicide tolerant plants, the first, one of the first most prominent risk scenarios that were formulated and phrased in the debate was, oh my God, you are going to create super weeds with that. And they were fully and completely wiped off the desk. And everybody voicing that I was there, I was one of those, were, were, were assigned to the esoteric kingdom that even raising that, that idea. Totally, completely, absolutely. That comes when you were in the room, you can say these things, you know. So today, and then there was denial, no, it cannot happen. And then, then it did happen, then you couldn't deny it anymore. It went through all those phases that you see in these kinds of things, not only in GMOs, you know. First, it's impossible, then you cannot deny it anymore. Then, and then it said, so what, who cares? And then ultimately it was like, oh, okay. Well, now we're at a point where you can't possibly ignore it anymore, where you can't possibly deny it anymore. 
And now uh, what you read, go to the Monsanto or the company's websites and read what they say. They say, whole oh, farmers, mm -hmm. you must not use only one ingredient on one compound. We told you so, which is not true. Um, you okay. must use a mix of the compounds. You must, you know, use our new multiple herbicide resistant plants and throw the whole, you know, ammunition range you have of herbicides at your plan and then you shall uh, get rid of, of the um, resistant weeds. Too bad that we now have multiple resistant <laughs> weeds. Palmer amaranth has, is now resistant against the Camba and 2,4-D and glyphosate, etc. you know, which was clearly coming along. But it's, the blame is placed on the farmer who should have known that he should not rely on one technology only and on one compound, although that very same stakeholders have been denying that and have been fighting foot and nail or teeth and nail um, for getting that message out that you should only be growing herbicide tolerant plants because they will save you um, money and effort and will save whatever, you know, save the world. That's the narrative. They blame it on the farmers. Thank you. Um, the last question from a participant. Is the innovation principle going to be considered in EFSA risk assessment? Um, innovation principle. That's a new principle. I'm not even sure it's been implemented already and it's been written in the laws. I'm I'm not the right one to answer. Maybe I'm going to leak okay. all about it. I think, I think Eric has got something to say about well, it. Well, yes, I mean, the, the, this, this notion of, a, of an innovation principle has been advanced by uh, people representing commercial and industrial interests saying, you know, the trouble with the precautionary principle is it neglects the vital importance of innovation. And so we have to erect a similar principle and we have to balance them against each other. Uh, and there's, there was pressure to do that under, under the, the, the previous European Commission. And if the, the question is, is innovation, you know, a favorite pro-innovation stance going to be considered in ESSA risk assessment? My answer is, I don't know what is going to happen because I can't predict the future, but I'm convinced that in, in an unacknowledged way, a preference for the encouragement of innovation has long been a consideration in EFSA risk assessments. Yes, you, you know, we, we must go out, I mean, and I, <coughs> I think I mentioned uh, uh, last week the occasion when a risk assessor says, you know, we have a special responsibility to avoid false positives. You know, we we must make it as easy as possible for innovations to be developed and implemented. So I think uh, th that perspective is already influential in EFSA, and I fear it will remain so. Um, and uh, it would be dreadful if it is even stronger. Could I just add again, uh, Diedrich, that? you know, the innovation principle or the commitments behind it and the interests behind it are already yeah. in play in EFSA risk assessment. That's, you know, that's the whole point of our critique, not only of the risk assessment itself, but of the framing of the risk assessment or what we call, and Codex Alimentarius called, which the EU and all member states have signed up to, risk assessment policy. Uh, and even the US National uh, Research Council, effectively the National Academy of Sciences report that Eric described last week, the Red Book on uh, Risk Assessment and Management, uh, also actually recognised that evidence is often short of adequate for actually making confident scientific inferences about possible harm. And in those cases, you know, that they were basically saying, yes, in those circumstances, which are pretty much universal within risk assessment science, particularly again, when you go to environmental risk assessment, we have to have non-scientific policy commitments, which are defined for the risk assessors by the risk managers, i.e. the policy actors, and with all of the relevant and associated 
deliberative processes with stakeholders and so on, as Codex defined it, as Eric described it last week, that those policy commitments which frame the science, you can't do science without those commitments of one kind or another. They need to be accountable and explicit. And in European Union and with EFSA, they are not. And that's a central part of the problem for the Commission and for EFSA. And not to mention for farmers and the users of their products, i.e. us, European citizens. Yeah, yeah. And I still defiantly speak of myself. You, you still think of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> not for very much luck. <laughs> It's your turn next week, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, maybe just one last question for myself. Um, I find myself wondering with all this, um, how this reductionism in the risk assessment has come about, who inspired it originally, or what inspired it, or who is behind it? Did we or did anyone else fail to pay attention when these risk assessment procedures were drawn up? to give them another direction? No, no, we were there. I mean, we, we, I'm speaking about these things since, I don't know, it feels like a hundred years, but it's, it's easily 15 years <laughs> yeah. or longer. So, so um, it's interest, it's power struggle. It's, 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 yeah, it's very basic. <laughs> so what made it so difficult to stop it? Uh, who, who, who was behind? There's one simple five letter word, power. Mm. Money. Another one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, maybe okay. we can elaborate on that sometime else. That's a, that's a big question to answer. But the short, the short version is power and money. Yeah, right. Thank you all, um, especially Angelica today, of course. Um, thanks very much to all the participants. Um, there's a thank you and a thumbs up in the Q&A box. Um, so uh, we hope to welcome as many as possible of you participants next week, Thursday, the 1st of October for the last webinar in this series with chiefly Professor Brian Wynne as a speaker, but all the other speakers that you saw will be present next week as well and we'll be happy to enter into a discussion.